Yeah. Okay, everybody. Uh, since the music has stopped, it's an important time to go ahead and do the intro now. So I, I wanted just to, first of all, start by saying thank you for joining us at, uh, at SG Innovate. It's, there's a lot going on today, uh, this week, a tremendous amount of uh, opportunities, events, so it's very energizing. We just came from an event uh, out at Expo where uh, former President Barack Obama was speaking about world issues and leadership and the importance of maintaining, maintaining a vision for the future and so on, so it's very energizing. And now we have this opportunity with our friends from Ecosystem. So I think the great thing for us is to celebrate what we always try and celebrate, which is entrepreneurs, people that are entrepreneurially minded to try and tackle some really tough problems. So my current pet peeve or my current uh, rage against the machine is that there's lots of money, lots of resources, lots of enthusiasm for things around solving incremental problems of convenience. So if you wanted food delivered slightly faster, I can definitely find you investors and others that would like to back you. But if you want to work on things like computer vision for diagnosing different conditions and getting that implemented into a hospital, that's a tough thing. Not because building the tech is impossible, because we have lots of great people doing it, but because adoption is hard. Because the regulatory environment, the use of data, the doctors, the administrators, the insurance, and I'm not running anybody down, it's just these are realities of changing models, and it's hard. So when we think about futures and we think about cybersecurity, inevitably important for all of us, there isn't a day, a minute that doesn't go by without somebody trying to breach some system. And it has a negatively reinforcing cycle, which is if there's a breach, first thing everybody does is say, we have to close the doors and shutters and lock everything up tight and that makes data even more difficult to work with for people that are trying to build important technology to improve things. So we worry about cybersecurity. When we think about AI, we're huge advocates. We've got already many investments. As a team, we've made plus 80 investments into early stage deep tech startups. But many of those are in something that has to do with artificial intelligence. Uh, ML, or we think of NLP, or we think of vision, so we're big advocates. We think it's important. We think AI is not only important, but inevitable, and we think we ought to embrace it. We want to work with it more. We don't see it as something to be feared. So we want to talk about data and governance. So we think AI is important. When we think about future of mobility, future of health, these are all important topics because it, they affect all of us, right? They affect us in Singapore and they affect us in many places outside of Singapore. So that's why we like today's topic because we think, whether you call it smart city or as Singapore thinks of it as smart nation, we think that these are very, very important, critical human problems. And the thing that we wanna talk about is human problems, right? We're not interested in things that are incremental or marginal. We wanna talk about tough topics and we wanna talk about the role that play in improving those human condition problems. That's why we're happy to be uh, teaming up with Ecosystem to have that discussion. So what we're going to do is, before I hand over the microphone, we are going to have our long established and I hope not unpleasant tradition where we're gonna take a photograph and say hello to everybody. So what we're gonna do is have one of my teammates who's gonna kindly do the photo and everybody's gonna jump up and look like you're happy to be here. <laughs> and what we're going to do then is if you're interested or worried about data privacy, you've gotta look at your shoes or do something that obscures your face because otherwise you are on camera. So we are gonna stand up and uh, take a pic.
Okay, I am officially done. Am I handing it over to Amit? Yep. Okay, then uh, thanks everybody for joining and now uh, off with the rest of the show. All right. Fantastic. Well, <laughs> well I'm going to keep it really short and sweet. My, my job was the fun guy because I was told we had beers afterwards. But look, I just want to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank ISG Innovate uh, for, for um, supporting us with this um, with our ecosystem predictions, and most uh, most importantly to all of you for taking the time to be here. Some of you have uh, had to fight rain to be here, and it's a full house, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to give a quick um, summary. Every year we do, uh, we write predictions on, on key technology themes and topics, um, and for this year there are four themes that we have worked on um, that are supported by SG Innovate, uh, and they're focused on cities of the future, the future of health tech, um, you know, artificial intelligence and its impact, and cybersecurity. So we're really excited to have the speakers um, share their, their perspectives. But I just wanted to say how proud I am to have this opportunity to work with SG Innovate for, for a variety of reasons. One, um, because you guys are doing a tremendous job, uh, you know, with Steve's vision and, and a great team at SG Innovate that are actually leading Singapore into um, you know, that leadership position in that deep tech space. I think there's, uh, what I love the most about SG Innovate is the ability to actually solve real world problems, make it a better place, and find, find ways to support real scientists with, through um, helping them with commercial success. And I think that is a huge step, and that's where, um, you know, a lot of great um, technology initiatives that can actually impact the world uh, fall over because people are focused on investing in short-term gains, whereas SG Innovate has this long-term view on um, supporting these um, startups through that journey so that they can actually get to that point of fruition and, and, and solve the problems. So really excited. Uh, I am going to hand it over to uh, Ulrich Loeffler, who's the chair for today. He's going to walk us through the rest of the day. I just wanted to say we've got uh, it's festive season, you big Christmas tree there, so we want everyone to make merry, you know, spend some time, get to know each other, um, and um, in, enjoy the, the food and drink, but uh, most of all, enjoy some ecosystem beers. We've got a selection of our own craft ecosystem beers. Um, it's not a gimmick. We actually have those on a regular basis, so if you do want those, if, you know, on a regular day, just come by our office and, and, and you'll get some. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Uli, and thank you again for being here. Thank you, um, thank you, uh, Ahmed, and thank you, um, Steve, as well. Thanks for having us and hosting us. I wanted to say um, a thank you to uh, Grace as well, who is um, uh, pretty much the mastermind behind um, the event today. Um, so. I've got to admit, I was actually a little bit worried when uh, we chose the uh, Monday before Christmas or the last week before Christmas as um, the, the date for the event. I thought, like, look, is there actually any gone, anyone going to be left in Singapore to, to do actually work and attend? But I'm um, looking at the crowd today. I think, first of all, Singapore is still working hard, I've got to say. <laughs> and I um, also wanted to thank all of you for spending this afternoon um, you know, with us. Um, Ahmed already mentioned we, um, you know, we've got this um, predictions, like uh, pretty much like an outlook for, for the year ahead, um, which we um, have two of the authors uh, for, for, for two of these reports we've got here. Both of them flew in within the last uh, 24 hours, and some of them will actually fly out within the next uh, four hours. So I'm um, you know, really pleased to have them here. Um, first of all, Alex Wernde from uh, Melbourne and Tim Sheedy from Sydney, but he actually flew in from his holiday in uh, Phuket. His wife and his kids are still in Phuket on holiday. So thanks for uh, breaking your uh, holiday a little bit short. Um, but um, then afterwards, we um, also invite a few industry experts for an interactive panel discussion where we want to have a look on how some of these trends are really impacting, first of all, the Singapore market, but also some of the industries um, you know, that are maybe most relevant to us. So we want to keep this interactive, so there will be uh, an opportunity for you as well to participate. So please um, you know, pay attention. If you want to uh, ask a question to one of the speakers or one of the panelists, please um, note it down, and you've got the opportunity to do that later. Um, just wanted to quickly put a note out as well. Does the where do I have to point it? Ah, oh, okay. Okay, turn it on. Okay, these ones are the uh, four predictions documents, which are kind of the uh, underlying content for for today. Um, if you haven't seen them yet or haven't um, you know read them yet, they are available on the SG Innovate um, website or also on the um, ecosystem uh, in our website. Um, so please be free, they're freely available, um, you know, so you can um, you know, use and consume them and share them with your, with your colleagues um, or, or loved ones for Christmas. Um, 
if you are interested in some more research, um, I encourage you as well to um, go to your iTunes store or to your um, Google Play store. Uh, there is an ecosystem research app which you can um, download and register. And there's a lot of content, you know, real-time market information, some more blogs, video content, uh, research reports as well, which are available to you. There's a second reason to download the app is um, between all the registrations from here today, um, we will give out some uh, ecosystem beer uh, for you to, to, to take home and to consume under the Christmas tree at home. So, um, you know, if you, um, you know, want to be in for the draw, you know, if you download uh, or go to, your, go to your app store and download it, register, and then after the, uh, during the networking, you can go to the regist registration and pick up your, your well-deserved beers. Um, so with no um, further ado, um, we've done that part already, so we can jump to the next one. I would like to introduce the first speaker, which is um, uh, my colleague Tim Sheedy. As I said, like, you know, he was uh, on the beach until about 7 o'clock this morning, um, you know, flew in from Phuket today. So he is our principal advisor for artificial intelligence, but also um, in our customer experience. Um, he's got a, a long-standing career in, in research. He was for 12 years the um, principal analyst for Forrester for Asia Pacific as well, um, you know, working with organizations all across Asia Pacific on you know, IT improvements, um, the customer journey journeys and so forth. So please welcome Tim Sheedy. Oh. Whoops. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, one, one sort of follow-up comment I'll make if you're, um, if you're actually drinking beer underneath the Christmas tree, you've probably had a few too many. <laughs> I know I'd have to lie down to be under mine. Um, so first of all, thank you all for joining us here. Um, over the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking you through the, the, the top five predictions that we have around AI automation and analytics. Um, but before I jump into that, I guess I wanted to sort of make a, a broad statement about artificial intelligence. Um, I believe that in our lifetime, artificial intelligence will be the most significant technology that will have the biggest impact on our life. Right? I think to date, there's many people holding them up already, the smartphone, right? That's probably the technology we can all point to and say, this is a technology that's changed my life the most, right? But AI is creeping up on us in the same way that the smartphone did, right? It's, it's funny that um, I, I don't think we all realise how dependent that we've got on the smartphone and, and none of us really remember that time before the smartphone when you didn't have everything you wanted, you know, in your pocket, basically. Um, I remember for me when AI crept up on me and when I realised the impact, it was about, I think it was 2015, I was driving in the car with my kids and my kids actually asked me, um, we were talking about the Queen and the Queen of England and hence Australia. Um, at, and I don't know why we were talking about the Queen, but the kids asked me, oh, you know, Dad, how old's the Queen? Right? And this was the uh, glorious period of my life before my kids got smartphones and they still interacted with me. Um, and so they didn't have a smartphone to look it up on, right? And I was driving, so I couldn't go to Google. And I clicked the Siri button, you know, I clicked the home button on the iPhone and said, Siri, how old's the queen? And it gave me the answer. And I just had one of those, like, mind-blown moments going, how amazing is that? That sitting here behind the wheel of the car, I've asked a phone a question and it's given me an answer. And you're going, that's really crapped up on us. Like, we, like the massive amount of technology capability you need to deliver the age of the queen to me while I'm driving is incredible, right? Yet it's all there and it's all available at our fingertips. And, and really looking at the different um, voice assistants, Siri's probably one of the dumbest out there, right? So the, the point is the other ones are better than that and they've all made great advancements since 2015. So, you know, I, I do honestly think we're going to look back in 5, 10, 15 years and go, Wow, AI is really changing the world. In, in fact, I'd even argue, has anyone had the stage when you're working with a technology and it doesn't learn and you get annoyed, right? I, I've had that. I'm, I'm, I, I tend to keep up with technologies, but one area I'm a bit of a Luddite is the GPS, right? I use the TomTom GPSs, right? Um, you know, I'm not using the one on my phone. It's because every time I've tried the one on my phone, I get to a difficult intersection, a five-way roundabout, and I get a phone call, and I don't know where to go. It happens consistently every time I do it, so I stick with my you know, single-purpose GPS device. 
And I go drive into the city of Sydney once or twice a week, every week for the last five years, and I never go the way it tells me to go. It always says go this way, and I've never once gone that way. And every time I go, how have you not learned? Right? How has this machine not learned the fact that I'm always going this other way? So tell me the traffic on that route, not on the other route. Right? And say, um, it's one of those things where, I, as I said, I've got to the point where things don't learn, where machine learning isn't integrated, where I'm starting to go, why is that the case? And again, it's creeping up on you when Gmail types ahead and it writes the phrases that you typically use, right? Um, you know, there's intelligence in so many applications in Word, in Excel, in PowerPoint, in the basic um, applications that we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. There's all these little things in there that you don't realise are learning from your behaviour um, and making your life that, that little bit easier. So, before I jump into the predictions, I thought I'd do a bit of a set the scene of where we're at globally with the use of AI. So you can see, oh, I'm in the way of this one. I'll move over here. Um, you can see that, I'll, first of all, I'll explain, we include IoT sensor analytics in the AI technology space. That'll become obvious when I get to my last prediction of why we do that. But AI is as much about the data as it is about the learning. And the data generation is as much about the IoT sensors, um, and even more so in the future, um, as, it, as it is about any other data sources. So IoT sensor analytics and machine learning are the most um, heavily used today, but you can still see the penetration is only around 10, 15%, right? Um, RPA is up there too, robotic process automation. One of the comments I'll make about RPA, that this is the global numbers in more mature economies like Australia, Singapore, the US, the UK, RPA is in my 27 years as a technology analyst, the fastest growing technology I have ever seen. It has gone from two years ago, no one knew what RPA was, to in economies like ours, it's 30, 40% penetration. And every business is finding more and more use cases for robotic process automation within their business. Um, but then you can see you move down to chatbots and facial recognition, and then down the bottom here, I know Steve mentioned deep learning and semantic computing. I honestly believe that you know, to, to do really good AI and smart AI will need to get better at semantic computing. Um, the penetration of these, yes, it's going to grow and it's going to grow quickly, but off a really small base. Um, we're still a long way away from mass market penetration from most of the AI technologies up there at the moment. In terms of the projects, it's interesting what Steve was saying that, you know, th this idea that you're, you know, trying to solve, um, you know, these incremental use cases, this is where AI is actually going. AI is moving away from the big moonshot style engagements that, you know, like if you think of the big ones of two, three, four years ago of, you know, um, health clinics trying to um, treat people with cancer more effectively and trying to um, read cancer on, on graphics, organisations going after the really big problems in their business. Um, and trying to solve them with AI to actually moving to these smaller use case driven, you know, looking at a pain point in an application or a process and using intelligence and learning to take that pain away. So if you look at it, you know, we, we don't have any more of these projects that take 15, 20, 25% of our IT budgets. Most of them are 2 to 5% of, of our spending. Um, and that's also being shown in the length of the project. We're getting value much faster out of AI because they're smaller projects, right? Because we're aiming for these smaller initiatives, just trying to drive little changes within our business. You can see the vast majority of, um, and so this is actually comparing our data from 2018 to 2019. Um, you know, the, the, the projects used to be one year to two years and quite a few of the AI projects were up here in the more than two years. Like these are the, the real moonshot trying to, to solve, you know, world peace, basically. Um, and you can see it's very much moving down to the six months to one year phase in terms of the length of the, the, the projects that are going on within businesses. So I hope that gives you a bit of an idea of the state of play of AI. Um, it's very, you know, it's quite immature in a lot of businesses. Where businesses are doing it, they are looking for the quick wins more so today than the, the, the bigger initiatives that they were going after previously. So starting off with the predictions, the first one is that analytics is going to return to the top of the IT priority list. Now, 
I'll make it clear, analytics are on top of the IT priority list, not the technology priority list. Now, a lot of you have probably worked with IT teams, a lot about IT teams, um, maybe come, came from an IT itself, and you've gone through the changes in businesses, and we're seeing it happen at the moment in Singapore in particular, and across ASEAN, where the IT team is being redistributed out into the business. Software developers are being pushed out into the different teams. The, the ownership of applications is being pushed out into the different teams. And many IT departments are going through a bit of an existential crisis. They're trying to work out, you know, wh why are we here? Why do we exist? Um, you know, there are a lot of IT departments that aren't really that much more than a sort of core data team, a core support team, end user computing and maybe a bit around the data center and network. Um, but if you look at everything else, the applications and most of the data centers all being driven to the cloud, to SaaS, um, and out into the business teams. So that means IT teams have gone, well, what can we do to help the business, right? So the business is trying to be agile, they're trying to be fast, um, they're moving towards digital businesses. Analytics is really hard. As I, I mentioned this idea that we're pushing our applications out to the teams that use them. CRM is going out to sales. ERP is going out to finance, manufacturing, et cetera. So when you want to do really good analytics and you sit within that team, you only have access to the data in that team. And the reality is you want data from many different sources to do great analytics. And this is where IT has suddenly realized that actually this is our, our role, our way back in. Right, this is what we're going to be doing. This is our, how we can really help the business be fast and innovative and agile and, and help them become a digital business. And so we've actually asked a lot of um, CIOs, you know, what is your number one priority and how you're going to help the business become digital? And most of the time they're saying we're going to be driving great analytics capabilities. We're going to help them make better decisions faster. And this is why they get better decision making. Um, improve their competitive advantage, reduce their cost of operations, enhance their internal processes, process monitoring and alerts, workforce optimization, et cetera, et cetera. There are many reasons why analytics is going to, uh, is coming back to that top of the priority list. Um, analytics has always been up there in that top five, but the last time something like analytics was top of the list was about five, six, seven years ago when it was called BI. Right, and it was a big centralized function. Now, you know, the, we all moved away from BI and we went to the, um, you know, the, 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 a self-use style BI. Um, and now we realize that actually we need to make our application smart, we need to make our processes smart, and this is where analytics is coming into um, the play again. Um, so the next prediction is that the spend that we're making around automation. So is, I'll just check, is everyone, is anyone not familiar with robotic process automation? RPA, a show of hands. Um, you're not familiar, a few people aren't familiar. Um, very quickly, robotic process automation is dumb automation in a business. It's when you have a process that you go, we've got a human who copies this information from this field and that field and then they copy it to that application and then they hit that button and then they hit that button. Let's just write a macro to do that. So RPA really is not that much more than macros. You know, it's taking a, a, a dumb human process um, and automating that process. What we're seeing though is the organizations that have gone a long way down the automation route are starting to go, so, I hit this button and this process runs and it does the same thing every time. What if I don't want it to do the same thing every time? What if I want it to learn? What if I want it to drive a different outcome based on the situation? And so this is where they're going, okay, let's make this dumb automation smart. So we're seeing organizations that have made these big investments, deep investments in RPA, are the ones who are also investing in other tech, sorry, in other technologies like, other AI technologies like sensor analytics, machine learning, um, you know, NLP, smart process automation, image analytics, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, you know, basically we are seeing that, um, what's the, the word, the, 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 the gateway drug? The RPA is sort of the gateway drug to, to the rest of AI. Um, if, you, if you're in the AI space, in your own business, um, I'd be looking for organizations that have 
strong automation capabilities, and they're the ones who are much more likely to be considering purchasing intelligent capabilities today versus those who haven't yet moved that far down the automation path. Um, so the next stage, I think this is the one that's probably going to have the biggest impact in 2020, is that our applications are going to get smart. Right? You think of the, the, app, the applications that we use, the ones that you guys might be building, the ones that um, you know, our ERPs, our CRMs, et cetera. You think of a traditional sale. Right? A customer calls up and a salesperson, someone in a call center, takes the call and they say, it's this customer. They do a customer lookup, you know, drop down, find the customer. Okay, what would you like to order? They say this product and so they search through the list, find that product. Um, and then they go, okay, we have to order that product from a supplier, let's find the suppliers, let's get their address, what's the quantity that you want, what size do you want, et cetera, et cetera, right? All these different things that you go through. Um, and that's because applications are dumb, right? And I actually have an example from my own life. I do quite a lot of DIY stuff. I like building fences in particular. Um, and I, you know, Bunnings is a big hardware chain in Australia. And I'm at my local Bunnings relatively regularly or making special orders over the phone, and I'm ordering pretty much the same thing every time, and it takes 15 or 20 minutes to get through that process. I'm going, so you know it's me, you know what I'm going to get to, you know what the endpoint is, how about we just jump to that endpoint, right? And that's what's happening in applications today, right? So I've got an example here um, from a, you know, a, a specific uh, ERP vendor. Um, where they've already actually started to make their application smart, right? So the customer rings up, you select the customer, and so what it does, it just automates all the fields. We know that this customer orders this many of that product, you know, most of the time they get it from that supplier who delivers it from that, this address and they deliver it to that address. And literally, the, it goes from a, you know, a, a, what, a, a 20, I think I've worked out in this um, uh, particular application, I think it says goes from a, a 20 clicks to actually do the order down to two fields. Now, it doesn't work 100% of the time because every now and then I'll ring Bunnings and I'll order something different, right? But the point is 80% of the time it does take a huge amount of time and effort out of the process. And when you're looking at AI spend, traditionally most AI spend has been focused on customer initiatives. The big growth is on internal. It's about saving money, saving time, saving effort, and actually trying to you know, reduce the human cost of processes. So I believe you know, we're already seeing it. Um, you know, applications getting smarter. And so what's changed here, though, is that SAP and Oracle and all the other big vendors, they used to ship their application, and then they'd ship an AI capability. And they'd say, you can make it smart. Just hire some data scientists and develop some algorithms and integrate it and then change your processes, et cetera, et cetera. What's changing in 20, end, you know, end of 2019, 2020, like this Ramco application, is the applications are smart out of the box. You don't need to hire data scientists anymore to do intelligent things within your business. And that is a massive barrier to AI in business. There aren't enough data scientists. It's that simple. You know, you look at how many Singapore's churning out, how many Australia, um, Malaysia, et cetera. We're not churning out enough data scientists to do all the AI things that we need to do. AI has to get easier. Um, there has to be a democratization of AI. And that's, that's another prediction that we have. I think this is more towards the end of 2020. We're going to see the cloud vendors in particular make their AI tools much more accessible, where you no longer need a data scientist to develop a new algorithm. I honestly believe that by the end of 2020, we're going to get to the point where a business user can create an, an algorithm for their business. You know, the, the system will ask for what data, what are you trying to achieve with that data. Um, it will do the learning itself. Um, there might be some, I know some of the big cloud vendors actually have a, a human service you can hire where they'll, they'll actually throw in some, some learnings there too. Um, it will do the learning and then deliver an algorithm to you. And I think the applications, as I said already, will get smarter so they can all automatically integrate that algorithm into the process um, to make that process different. Because that's what's ultimately about. AI is driving something different, right? So there has to be a change in a process somewhere. Um, it's not just about developing a great algorithm and continuing development. So I do believe that AI is going to be heavily democratized 
in 2020. It's gonna be much easier for your own organization and your developers to integrate AI into your tools um, and for your customers uh, to make their applications smarter. And the, the final prediction is around the edge. Now, um, this is one that I think is a bit of a nascent trend in 2020. Um, and that's because most organisations don't really have an edge or don't understand their edge, perhaps, is, is, um, is what's going on. And 5G is going to be one of the biggest drivers of this. So, why 5G? Well, most IoT applications today are one way. Right? It is a sensor that senses something, it gets data, and it sends that data off. Right? That's basically what an IoT sensor does today. What 5G enables, both in the the speed of the network to be able to do it quickly, the architecture of the network, the security of the network and the applications on the network is two-way IoT. And so most global operators are talking about launching two-way IoT with 5G. Right, so what two-way IoT is a sensor that senses and then does something. Right, so you know, there's someone walking across the road, I'll let a siren off to make sure no one runs them over or whatever. Right, um, you know, it's a sensor that you know, does something based off of what, it, uh, what, what it's sensing. So um, the thing is, this requires different architectures. It, it's an interesting one because uh, most organisations are not, not, you know, definitely in Singapore, not as much in the rest of ASEAN, but most of them are, are embracing hybrid cloud and public cloud today. Um, they're effectively moving away from this idea of owning their own hardware. But we believe going forward that 25% of the cloud and 25% of the computing in a business, in an average business, and this isn't just manufacturers, this is any sort of business, will actually be at the edge, right? So how does this work in an AWS world or an Azure world when all the computing is sitting in either here in Singapore or you know, even AWS in Singapore doesn't host all of its services in Singapore. Many of them, you know, you're actually calling back to services back into the US. Um, and if latency is a problem, if this is a public safety, if this is a driverless car situation, you don't have the luxury of the ping time back to the Singapore data center, back to the US data center, and back again to be able to do the learning, the analytics, and make the decision and act. The decision needs to be made on the edge. We actually need computing at the edge, is what's going to, go, well, is what's going to change. And we're going to need learning at the edge. Because again, we don't, you know, what, there are a few two-way IoT things today that is uh, very much this happens and do this, this happens and do this. And what organizations have implemented this are doing is that they are constantly having to update the algorithm because they're getting new data and they actually don't want the same thing to happen every time. The, you know, the situation changes slightly over time. So therefore, we're going to need machine learning and artificial intelligence at the edge, which requires new computing um, architectures to be able to deliver that. Um, wh what's interesting, however, is that while we understand things like AI and edge computing, and wh what this graph shows is we ask people, how much do you understand th these different technologies? And the red is that they fully understand, and the black is saying they have no concept of it. So yes, you know, nearly 30% of organizations saying they fully understand edge computing. Um, artificial intelligence is up there closer to 50% is saying they fully understand the opportunities there. Edge analytics, we've got 30% of organizations saying they have no concept of what it is, right? So this is why I think this is one of those nascent predictions that we are going to want to drive capabilities at the edge. We're gonna need analytics at the edge. We don't really know what that means today, many of us don't understand that. So I think we're all gonna have, play a really important role in educating the market on what you know, smart analytics is, on what real-time data at the edge looks like and feels like, and what the capabilities you'll need to be able to deliver that. Because as I said, edge computing breaks all of our current technology architectures. You know, we, we had the all in our own data center architecture, well that doesn't work with edge computing. Now we're moving to our own data center in the cloud or just the public cloud. Again, for most of the cloud, I know uh, Alibaba actually has a, um, Alicloud has their own sort of edge computing 
device that they actually sell as part of their cloud platform, but most of the other vendors aren't there yet when it comes to that. So, um, so you know, it requires a, a new type of hardware, a new type of capability, a new way of doing learning and machine learning on these new devices that are going to sit at the edge of our network. And that network might not be actually be our network. It might be a, you know, a, a telco's network. And this is it. This is one of the real enablers why I think 5G will drive this faster, is that 5G gives you the architecture and the, the virtualization of the networks, et cetera, for you to actually be able to rent a capability in their network to have your computing sit in their network right on the edge um, as close to the customer as possible. Um, what's interesting is how the conversation with technology is starting to change. So if you are in clients and you're, you're selling technology solution, what you'll start to see is you know, this old conversation of, okay, we want this application and we start developing it, and then in that development process, we decide on how we host that application. Now we're starting with what are we trying to achieve with that application before we even start to develop the service in our business? Because what we're trying to achieve will dictate the architecture that we need to use. If we need real-time analytics on the edge, it probably can't be in the public cloud, and it can't be in sitting um, within our own data center. We're going to need that somehow in the edge, and that might be our edge or it might be some public edge capability. So as I said, the conversation's really starting to change around how we're making decisions and how your clients and other technologists are making decisions. They're starting with the question of how we're going to help, you know, what's the purpose of this application? And it's going to dictate many of the other pieces that come after that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip over that one. Sorry, I thought I removed it. So, I'm um, just wanting to recap the predictions. Basically, analytics is going to be a top IT priority. There is going to be significant amount of spend on analytics platforms where much of AI is today actually is in the data. It's not in the applications. You see that in all the large vendors. All the large vendors have backed off the capabilities of AI, and they're all focusing on making sure they have the data and the capabilities to be able to deliver, to be able to do better learning. Um, interestingly, AWS just launched a new service um, in their marketplace where anyone can sell data to any other organization. Now, why that's important is that most organizations find out pretty quickly when they go down the machine learning route is that they don't actually have all the, all the data that they want. Actually, some of the data that they want is someone else's data. Um, it might be Facebook's data, Google's data, et cetera. Um, so they're out there trying to actually, um, um, you know, other organizations can now sell you that data. It's being enabled in cloud marketplaces like the AWS marketplace, and you can integrate that data straight into your machine learning tool. You don't have to particularly go out and find every particular data point that you need to, to drive better learnings. Um, automation, you know, is the gateway drug to AI. Any organization that you see doing automation, they will be doing smart things soon. AI is going to be everywhere, really. That's you know, a, a really big learning. If you're developing an application uh, yourself, you need to make it smart. It's that simple. Right? It is an expectation that the applications will be smart out of the box. Um, AI will be democratized. It's going to be much easier for us all to access AI. Both developers, I, as I said, I think 2020 will be the year that it actually gets beyond, AI gets beyond the developer, where we don't need an IT person involved anymore to be able to do something smart within a business. And AI is going to be required on the edge, and as I hope have, I've demonstrated, the edge requires whole new architectures, whole new ways to make decisions within businesses, which, as I said, which is why I think that's a nascent one. I think it's going to delay many of the decisions and changes that are going on. But uh, now I'm going to... Uh, thank you very much for your time and hand back to Uli. Hey. Oh. Let me say again first. Thank you, um, thank you, Tim. And um, when he's actually heading back to Sydney tomorrow, he can give Bunnings a call straight away because just before his holiday to Phuket, um, a storm went over Sydney and damaged his fence. So I guess you've got to rebuild it again. Three fences. Three fences. So um, he's, he's going to keep busy over, over Christmas. No, but thank you very much for your time. And um, Tim will also be joining the panel discussion later. So if you've got any questions on um, you know, Tim's presentation, please hold back. We can address it um, at the panel later.
The other thing, I saw quite a few people of you um, taking pictures um, of the slides. Obviously, feel free to do so, feel free to tweet, it's all public um, uh, content. But we will also share the slides afterwards. We're also recording the session, it's actually live streamed on YouTube. And um, you know, we, we sent you out a link for the, for the recording, so if you wanna recap something. So in case you missed the slide, don't worry, you, you will have a, have a chance to get it later. Um, with that, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Alex Wernde, um, based in Melbourne, so he flew in last night. Um, Alex is um, a principal advisor for cybersecurity, um, specifically on the um, you know, governance um, uh, and risk side. Um, Alex is probably um, one, of the, one of the very few experts who actually lost a company once um, due to a cybersecurity breach, a very successful business uh, which got hacked and uh, had to close down on the back of that. Um, since then, he's actually, um, you know, uh, you know, became, became more and more um, security expert. He's also at the moment the acting CISO for Vicinity Group, which is um, uh, a large shopping um, sh chain in, in Australia, and advising them on, um, you know, security risk and, uh, you know, best practices. So, really pleased that you made your made your way up here um, uh, from Melbourne. So please welcome Alex Wernde. Thank you. Thank you. Do the juggling act. Sorry. I'll do the juggling act. I'm going to put this down. This is my backup plan, my artificial intelligence, my machine learning right here. So if I uh, fall asleep, because I uh, must admit I've had a couple of overseas trips recently and I've, uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of traveling, so uh, I, I always need my backup plan. So thanks, Uli, and um, thanks, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, as Uli said, um, my background isn't deeply from or extensively from an analyst perspective. Uh, in fact, my, my work within, the, within this space is, is relatively new. Uh, for many years, I've been an entrepreneur, I've owned a business, I've built a business from the, from the ground up back in 2002, which was a web services business, as Uli said, that uh, ultimately we lost as a result of a cyber attack in 2011. Uh, it was a 30 minute breach, resulted in 10 day recovery, uh, and at the end of that 10 days, a fire sale of the assets. So where we started with nothing, we built a business that had about 10% market share, about 300,000 clients, uh, we ended up with nothing at the end of it. So as a result of that, I, I stepped into uh, talking about that incident, uh, trying to relay some of the learnings from that incident, and then sort of starting to get into studying the market, working with other companies to try and consult and, and help them with their governance, risk and compliance perspective, uh, uh, work around cybersecurity. Um, so as a result of that, I've been looking at the industry for you know best part of 10 years now, working within the industry, managing security functions, uh, and, and really getting deeply ingrained in it. So, you know, it's I'm here today to, to present the the security predictions that the ecosystem have uh, have put forward for for 2020. But I thought what I might do as a starting point is. Um, just again, like Tim did, just put some context around where we're at today, uh, taking some of the data from, from the ecosystem cybersecurity uh, research that's online. Uh, we're about to finish another decade, and despite you know the, the glossy appearance, I'm you know I'm not 25 anymore. I'm about to head into my my sixth decade. I was just working out when I was sitting there, which scares me. Um, but I've seen a few booms and, and cycles in that in that period of time, and, and cybersecurity is no different. We're, we're certainly in the midst of one right now with cyber. Um, but if we look back at where we've come in 10 years, so I lost the distributed IT business in 2011. At that stage, virtualization was a new concept. We we're just starting to explore taking physical machines that we had in data centers where we were leasing rack space. Uh, our backup plans might have been a second data center in a different geographic that we could uh, send our data to to back up. We might have some tape drives taking some backups as well. But it was physical. Our security controls were focused on physical. Uh, Virtualisation was just starting to, to, to come through. Cloud computing was, I think the analysts were probably talking about it at that stage, but it certainly was just a, a topic for conversation at, uh, at presentations like this. Uh, fast forward to 2019, not many of us are thinking first about getting a rack in a data center, going and buying some kit, installing it, networking it. We're just going online and consuming services. We're consuming software as a service, platforms as a service, infrastructure as a service. It's changed dramatically in that, in that period of time. From 20, 
10 to 2019, cybersecurity. In 2010, again, it was focused, the focus of security was it was an IT issue focused on physical controls at data centers. In 2019, we have governments establishing regulatory frameworks to protect our personal information. Privacy of our personal data is now paramount and it's front of mind for most, for most governments and most individuals around the world. It's changed within such a short period of time, I'd hate to try and do a prediction right now for what's going to happen in the next 10 years. So what we're actually presenting on is our predictions for 2020 because we can actually foresee those a little bit better than perhaps what we can see in, 20, uh, in, in 10, 10 more years' time. But if we look at the state of play from 2019 uh, through to sort of moving forward uh, into 2020, network and infrastructure security is still top of mind. There's still that legacy that I protect my perimeter, I protect my devices, and that's, that's a critical component, the primary component of my security function. Application security, uh, as you can see, is going to catch up. It might not catch up in 2020, but I think within the next couple of years, it certainly will catch up, shown by the, uh, the trends. And data security is, is racing, uh, and I think that, that will, along with application security, and we'll get into some of the predictions shortly, which will uh, hopefully uh, reinforce this. The big move of those SecOps, security operations and incident response. Now, the optimist in me says that people want to be prepared. The pessimist in me says that everyone's just resigning to the fact that it's going to happen and they're going to have to deal with it. Uh, but we're seeing a big focus towards security operations um, and incident response. When we talk about security operations, we're also looking at managed security. So from an opportunity perspective, managed security services is, is a, a real buzzword moving into 2020, and that's going to be one of the big areas uh, that we'll see race ahead in the, uh, in the coming years. A lot of the legacy security vendors that are still tried, uh, stuck on the perpetual licensing models, they're going to start to find it harder as organisations want to move from capex to opex spend within their budgets. Messaging security has obviously been strong for a period of time, continues to, to, to expect to grow. That's not going away anytime soon. The, I guess the ones that surprise me a little bit, given the nature of where we're going with cloud computing, um, is identity and access management, third from the end. Uh, it's gaining ground, but still a long way behind. And I think, again, the challenges of managing such distributed platforms and services and trying to bring all that together and manage your identities within an organisation is, is, is a, a massive beast. And having been through that process personally with a couple of uh, organisations I've worked with, I can understand why. Uh, and the other one is GRC, so Governance, Risk and Compliance Solutions. Um, I th suspect the reason that that's lagging is Microsoft Excel still got the corner, co market cornered for that. Um, it's probably easier to set up spreadsheets than that to actually in invest in a solution that manages it for you. So with that scene set, I'll walk through and I'll, I'll try and um, uh, stop, I'll try and get through this in about 20 or so minutes, try and give a bit of time for questions. As Uli said earlier, I am actually flying back to Melbourne overnight tonight, so um, I unfortunately can't hang around for, for the drinks and conversation afterwards. Uh, so I will give a little bit of time for some, some questions if, if there are any. Otherwise, I'll get you to the ecosystem beer a lot faster. The API vulnerabilities will become a main hacker target. And again, <laughs> I've seen this one firsthand just recently, which um, is, is quite concerning. Third-party risk is not, not a massively new concept. I think there's a lot more talk around third-party or supply chain risk at the moment. Um, but it's the method and the approach that they're taking which we're starting to see shift. Um, APIs by their nature, uh, you know, there's this massive demand, particularly with data science, um, you know, demanding all of this data exchange to and from. Their, um, you know, their, their environment so that they can consume and, and get this intelligence. The easiest way for them to do that is through APIs. And they're consuming APIs and services, and it's not just data science, it's, there's a large number of parts of the business that are doing this, they're consuming all of these microservices and they're connecting them up, and they're all connecting them up through insecure APIs. And these APIs, as soon as you start connecting these, these different services up, you've connected two or three up, you've, you've pretty much lost any chance of understanding your data flows. It's, it's almost impossible to try and reconcile that because that third-party supplier 
engages with another third party supplier who engages with another third party supplier and they're all consuming microservices to bring together their services that bring together their services which ultimately deliver what you want. So the ability to track where your data is going is, is almost impossible. So data breaches by attacking the APIs, the connectivity between these microservices is going to be um, one of the, the, the big areas that we, that we foresee sort of coming into the, the new year. The other thing that they, um, uh, again, first-hand experience they can, they can do is use those APIs to uh, poison the data supplies, so poison the data that you're getting in if they're insecure. Also use them as a, as a method for denial of service. So indirectly attacking your services by attacking APIs and bringing those down so that you can't actually connect to or consume the information or the uh, services that you're, you're subscribing to. Um, so we, we see, again, with you know, the stats showing this, this massive uplift in consumption of software as a service uh, and infrastructure as a service, APIs being a major attack vector coming into uh, 2020. Um, a couple of really interesting ones that have already come out. So late 2018, um, Google Plus had the API had an API bug which exposed, I think, about 500,000 um, uh, uh, records. And then Facebook, a couple of months later, had one that uh, was 1,500, I think, apps uh, had access to about 6.8 million users' private images. So we're already seeing some vulnerabilities being exposed in APIs. Uh, and our expectation is moving into 2020, we're going to see a lot more focus on that. Operational technology. So when I talk operational technology and IoT, I don't necessarily talk about your, your smart fridges or your smart TVs. Uh, talking a lot around industrial systems, um, even to the point of you know, sensors like Tim was talking about outside in the, in the street. The challenge with operational technologies is that a lot of it is 20 years old and it's been embedded into infrastructure that is 20 years old or 30 years old and it's very, very hard to change. The other problem we've got with operational technologies is there's no real regulatory frameworks to control that at the moment. Um, the focus across the world is on privacy of personal information. So, the, the um, data that OT normally holds is, is not really PI data, it's, it's ones and zeros, it's, it's little bits of information, you know, little stats, statistical information which is valuable for the consumer who needs that information to make business decisions uh, or to make health and safety decisions, not necessarily going to create a data breach. So without that regulatory framework around it, the desire or the, 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 the need for some of those vendors to really heavily invest in security of those systems is just not there. So the driver of security with o, in OT will come from incidents. Um, and I don't think necessarily we're gonna see major incidents in the next 12 months. There's always a chance, but I think that's a longer term, a longer horizon uh, 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 situation. What it does do though, uh, and I think the issue with OT security is, is that health and safety issue. Um, you know, where if we go back 10 years ago, looking retrospectively again at 2010 versus 2019, major conflict was probably considered to be, um, would be started by an invasion of, you know, by, by an army, by military. In 2019, the expectation is a major conflict would be started by a cyber incident. And more than likely, a cyber incident on OT infrastructure, systems that create interruption to everyday lives, to, to our ability to, uh, to operate. So I think on that backdrop, our, our, our prediction here is that we don't see any changes in reg regulation in the environment that will predicate an urgent sort of uplift in security uh, around OT. Um, in fact, with GDPR and, and privacy uh, regulations globally, so being the focus and continually, continually being evolved, that focus on PI and protection of privacy will always get the, the dollar first from a security perspective over something like OT. So if we, and building upon, upon that, our focus, if we look at our drivers of continued focus of cybersecurity, 
our focus is still on compliance. Two of the top five responses were industry and country compliance requirements, responding to an incident breach. The only part that OT may fall into there is project requirement, digital transformation perhaps, um, or if an organisation is very mature, their risk management program. But typically that risk management program would be a consumer or a user of that OT, then saying, hang on, we've got to put some security around this technology, going back to the vendor, vendor and saying, what are you doing about it? And the vendor saying, there's not much we can do at the moment. This is what it is. The other challenge with OT is a lot of these devices are very small and there's a physical restriction to actually doing anything um, that, that might warrant or might, might constitute you know, a security hardening of a device. Most of them don't have you know, the memory or the, you know, the storage capacity to, to you know, install security programs or technologies in there to provide any protections that you might want on the device. So we're down to protecting at a perimeter level, we're down to protecting at a server level, but we're not down to protecting at the device level. So at this point in time, we don't see uh, a major shift in OT security uh, compliance or security controls. And as a result, the expectation is that that's just going to continue to build a security debt that at some point in time, the big consumers, the big users of operational technologies and the big manufacturers of those devices are going to have to play a lot of catch up very, very quickly, which will cost them significantly more. The next one is AI training will receive the attention from regulators. So over the last couple of years, the big players, your Googles, um, Apples, Amazons have been building their platforms. Um, and I think this probably complements, uh, feeds into what Tim was saying earlier as well. They've been building their platforms. They're now moving into training their platforms. And until now, training their platform has meant capturing the information from the devices and using that to build and learn and tune their algorithms. It was um, brought out not that long ago, actually, that um, I think it was, it might have been Siri, uh, sorry, Alexa it was, where Alexa was actually recording everything that was said after it heard its name. And all of that information was getting fed back into their central servers for the learning. Um, at that point in time, yeah, there was a bit of an uproar about it. Um, they came out and they made the announcement that they were going to change their policy around how they tune and train their, their, uh, their platform and they're going for a more federated model. It hasn't quite happened yet and, and if, if that comes through that will be a, a good result. But essentially a federated model would be the data stays on the device, does the training there and just the, we'll call it the metadata, would get fed back um, without that sensitive information being fed back to the central servers. Um, Again, they've made the announcement that they're going to change their policy. The others haven't quite uh, got to that point yet. But we might see with the work that's being done under GDPR, I think Amazon's being looked at in Luxembourg um, uh, for privacy issues uh, under GDPR for this, for this particular point. We might just see uh, that change in the new year. And, and for the better, hopefully they all move to that federated model, but we will see potentially some breaches um, and certainly some claims against, uh, against privacy breaches under this particular model. Um, every one of the top AI solutions, well, yeah, these are the top AI solutions analysing personal data. The, the, I must admit, I'm not a fan of AI. <laughs> they talk about insecurity a lot, and um, we, we question it a lot because with, with, with AI insecurity, it, it, the issue with AI insecurity is that it doesn't take much to deviate slightly off course for the technology to then start to yield very, very wrong results. And from a security perspective, you start to yield very wrong results on a very short, short term, and you, you have a significant issue. But again, AI is very much focused, um, particularly with those big players, around Personal data, personalization, and building that, um, that personal um, solution that, that, that understands your every next and you know, next move. Um, I'll jump straight into the last one when this, sorry, the second last one, because this feeds in. Um, GDPR fines. We've seen GDPR come into effect since May 2018. Uh, we've been going now for its first full year in 2019. In 2018, there were two fines issued. In the first half of 2019, there were, I think, 17 fines issued for a total of about 54 million 
uh, euros, and the bulk of that was Google for one particular, uh, one particular issue. Uh, in the third quarter of this year alone, we had 12 fines issued uh, and somewhere around 328 million euros. Now, caveat, there are some of those fines that are still under review um, or under hearing, but what we're seeing is, is an exponential growth. One of the challenges we've had with uh, GDPR uptake is that once GDPR was, was released, all of the countries in the EU then had to work out their own policies and frameworks for actual implementation and, and management of this. We're starting to see them get, get that uh, established. We're starting to see them get some, get, uh, uh, get some, get some fines and get some processes under their, under their belts now. So what our expectation is in 2020 is that we're going to see a significant or exponential increase in this. Um, the offset of that is, as a result, the multinationals are, that may have previously not considered themselves too at risk in this particular scenario may start to invest a lot more in uh, security and compliance data management um, once they start to see a few more 100 million euro fines coming out in the, uh, in the new year. But we certainly see uh, a significant uplift. More closer to home uh, in Australia, you know, the, there's a Privacy Act in Australia. Um, I think most nations are starting to put these in place. The, the, the Privacy Act in Australia is actually, I don't think they've actually issued a fine. Uh, having said that, the maximum fine is, I think, a monetary amount of about $1.7 million. They're looking to change that at the moment to try and become a bit more aligned with this sort of model where it's a percentage of revenue. But as it stands today, um, you know, GDPR is, is the biggest focus for multinationals, just given the scale of the ability of the fines that they can actually issue, the scale of the reach. Um, so we, our expectation for 2020 is that we will see significant investment from the multinationals into security and compliance as a result of, or on the back of, uh, GDPR fines really ramping up. And the last one I'll talk to is M&As. Um, and I think for, for you know, this particular room as well, in particular in, in, you know, with SG Innovate and, and, and what a lot of people in the room here are, are looking to achieve, you know, you're looking for the opportunities and you're looking for you know, where the markets are at, you know, where are the gaps, what can, I, what can I get into? And cybersecurity presents a couple of really interesting um, opportunities at the moment. I, as I said, I've, I've been through a few cycles through IT, web services, digital media, um, and they all have a very similar process or flow about them. It's very, we'll call it the wild west at the start. There's a lot of small players, a lot of you know, very, uh, very deep technology-centric um, uh, players in the space. It gets market attention, it gets hold, everyone comes in, it starts to mature, it becomes fragmented because there's so many players in the market, everybody wants to set their own, get their own startup. The consolidations start to happen, um, and then the market starts to mature and stabilise. Uh, saw that in the in the 90s with computer hardware, uh, where we had first of all the, the the rise of the the home computer, and then we had Y2K not long after that, um, all the way through to 2000. Then we had in the 2000s we had digital media, and we saw all of these web services companies and messaging companies start up, start to consolidate. There was a big raft of consolidation sort of in the late uh, 2000s through through to sort of early sort of this decade, uh, and then it starts to mature and stabilise. Security is going through a similar thing at the moment. We're probably two or three years into it really taking hold, where it's really front of mind, and there's a lot of attention in the media, at government level. Everyone's starting to see the opportunity. So we're at that point now where we're starting to see a significant uplift in, in participants and opportunity in the space, significant up increase in budgets and spend. Uh, we're starting to see venture capital and private equity money come into the space. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll put this slide up there for you to, to, to look through. I won't talk through each of the, um, the deals in particular. You know, the most recent one is an Australian one, which is CyberCX, which is a private equity-backed um, roll-up of 12 consultancies to create the biggest consultancy business in Australia. So we're starting to see that money coming into the market um, to really take advantage of the opportunity within cybersecurity. The issue with it is it becomes more around a transaction for everybody rather than actually solving a problem. And so we're starting to potentially see the, the ability for, for, for the industry in some senses to lose its way a little bit where we're, we get the fear of missing out and we're worried about 
where to, you know, how do I get myself a transaction, either as a buyer or as a seller of a, of a, of a security business. Um, but I think there's no doubts with the work that's being done at government level, with the work that's being done in tertiary education, uh, there's going to be another raft of that security entrepreneur coming through soon. You've got some very large established players that are cashed up, that have been making good money for a long time, that are wanting to stay relevant. So they'll be looking for opportunities to acquire you know, new tech. Um, you've got the private equity, you've got the venture capitalists, um, and then you've just got the ones that have been in the game for 10 or 15 years that have had enough and they want to retire. Uh, all in all, I think 2020, we're going to see a, a, a marked imp increase in the number of transactions and the valuation multiples that we're going to see coming out of it. So from an innovation perspective, I think I would, I would put cybersecurity up there as one of the, the top sort of one or two industries uh, with an opportunity in the next few years to, uh, to capitalise on. So as I said, I promised I was going to wrap it up as quickly as possible so we can get to some questions uh, and get you over to some beers. To round off, so our, present, our, our, our predictions were a little bit, I wouldn't say disjointed, there's such a broad area in security and there's so many things happening. We had to try and pick the five big ones, the most relevant and the most pressing and the most, I would say, the most obvious in the next sort of 12 months. Uh, and I think API vulnerabilities, that whole supply chain risk, without a doubt, if you're developing technology, uh, you might not be a security firm, but if you're developing technology and you're looking to integrate uh, with other organisations, provide those data feeds, you, you're a development firm um, or a developer, think of your software development life cycle, make sure that you, uh, you invest in security as an organisation and you prepare yourself for the inevitable questions you're going to get from your clients around how you protect the data. Uh, and also consider the ownership of those APIs, who's responsible for uh, protecting them, who's responsible for monitoring them, and who's responsible for um, uh, uh, responding to an incident if there is a breach at an API level. Uh, OT security, uh, as I said, don't expect much of a change there, actually. I, th I think what we'll see is the same issues continue to reverberate but bounce around because of a lack of inaction from a compliance perspective. And as we saw with the stats, compliance is a big feature. If, if there's a compliance requirement, organisations will typically put that to the top of the queue and invest. Um, if there's not, they'll respond if they have an incident or they have a, a pressing need that's being called out for any specific reason. But OT, I think, is still going to slip under the cracks and I think there's some physical constraints that are going to hold that back for, for some time to come. Um, AI training, uh, yeah, hopefully these federated models will come to play uh, in 2020. I think um, the US is uh, stagnating a little bit on, on bringing out some policies around that, but EU, uh, the expectation is that the EU will, will, will come ahead, particularly under the auspices of, of GDPR, and start to regulate um, uh, the use of that information. Uh, GDPR fines will force MNCs, so um, the spend in security will significantly grow, um, if it hasn't already grown, but the spend in security will significantly grow, particularly at the bigger end of town with multinationals, as a result of GDPR starting to find its feet and the fines really growing. So the budgets within security or for security are going to continue to grow significantly in 2020. I don't think we've seen any sort of uh, sign of any ceiling at that front at this stage. Uh, and as a result, wrapping all of those things together is probably an environment that is ripe for M&A activity. It's ripe for high evaluations, it's ripe for innovative ideas and the ability to get audiences with, uh, with, with uh, buyers um, and therefore obviously take advantage of one of the top two or three global risks that we're facing today. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Ollie. I might, I might leave um, this uh, microphone with you. Is this one actually on as well? Sure. It's good. Um, Alex, unfortunately, has to jump on a plane uh, in about a couple of hours. So he won't be able to join the panel. But if there's any immediate questions that uh, anyone would like to ask on any of the predictions. Everyone wants the beer. Everyone wants the beer. I would have actually one. So um, I hope I don't
throwing into the deep end. I actually have two questions. But um, the first one, we talked, um, you know, with the development in technology, you know, we hear a lot of companies say, look, no matter what industry you're operating in, you've got to view yourself as a, as a technology company. Because essentially technology will, you know, be the source of innovation. Sorry. Oh, this one works. Um, sorry for that. Um, so technology is the, the source of innovation. So every company, no matter what industry you're working on, has to see themselves as a technology company. Do you think in the same way every company has to see themselves as a security company? Because no matter what you put out there, how you leverage different technologies or APIs that you're offering, um, you know, you know, and actually one of our, our research stats is as well that 70% of organizations in Asia Pacific um, believe that a breach is, in, is, is, is uh, imminent. So uh, I think everyone knows it's, it's, a, it's a matter of time. So do, do you have to see yourself as a security company? Uh, I, th I think they do, personally. Um, it goes back to, I know we talk about the API sort of, uh, attack sort yeah. of scenario, but supply chain risk is, is, is a hot topic. It's a massive topic at the moment. And the, that challenge with third, fourth, fifth line suppliers, you don't realise your involvement in or the, your, your importance in the security of organisations when you're dealing with any type of information uh, until it's thrust upon you in an incident. And, and at that point, it's, it's almost, you know, sort of running into a, a brick wall a million miles an hour. It, it, you have to understand that if you're dealing with data or information of any sort, then um, the responsibility is there to protect it. And the, what we'll see is, the government brings in the regulations, and they normally target the bigger end of town. That feeds into the, you know, they, they protect what they can that they that they look after, uh, and then they start to have incidents because the attackers start to go through you know, that supply chain. They start to look at the next tier down. So uh, at that point, the large companies start to push their requirements down to that organisation, but then they start to push, you know, into. The, you know, the next layer down again. So all we're seeing is this this cycle of you know sort of pushing the requirements down. So what's happening? You know, for those who are developing systems and dealing with larger corporations, uh, has anyone in the room received a questionnaire um, around security of um, of or how they protect their information or how they protect their systems? Um, that's one of the big things you're going to see in the next couple of years. Every major company, every time they engage as part of that process, they're going to start to send out a security questionnaire. Um, to make you fill that in, to show them how you're protecting their information. And it could be really irrelevant. You could say, well, I'm not really dealing with any. I'm selling you chocolate bars. They'll still want to know how you protect that information because that might lead to another supply chain or you know, another threat vector that they'd thought about or another risk. So that's, that's something that we're just going to see more and more of. Okay. Maybe we'll, time for one question otherwise. One last take. Everyone wants, wants a beer? Okay, then thank you very much, um, Alex, again, for, you know, for making your time. I might take this one of you. I might take this one of you as well. And we've got to move some furniture around. Um, while they're doing that, um, I might introduce the next, um, actually, the facilitator of the panel. Um, we, um, uh, as we said, like we talked about artificial intelligence, we talked about um, security. Um, those ones, what we feel is like underlying um, trends, which are affecting a lot of um, you know other industries. Specifically, um, uh, you know the other topics were cities of the future and um, and health tech. So we would like to now invite um, an industry expert panel to talk a little bit more about you know their experience, their views on how this may all play out um, over the next year. Um, to facilitate that, I would like to introduce my colleague Sesh Mukherjee, who is actually also the author of the health tech um, predictions. So um, if you've got any questions there, so she can actually answer some as well. Uh, and she's also the co-author of the Cities of the Future um, predictions, which um, uh, the other author, Amarandeep Sudan, unfortunately had to go to another engagement overseas, so he um, uh, couldn't be here tonight. Um, but um, so um, you know, Sesh can, uh, can cover that as well. So with no further ado, I might invite Sesh onto the stage to then introduce the respective panelist. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I'll do that. I'll do that. And, oh, actually, I should be here. <laughs> and a huge big thank you to SG Innovate for giving me the opportunity. I've always been a huge fan of the energy, you know, and the, the big vibes that you bring. You know, you have a very eclectic group here, and it's always a pleasure attending one of your sessions. Uh, but to go on with the panel, I obviously need to invite the panelists. So I'll start with uh, Carolyn Chin Perry, the MD and Digital Accelerator Leader for PwC. 
Uh, Carolyn wears multiple hats. Why don't you join me, Carolyn? She wears multiple hats, but across the session, we let her wear some of them. But uh, I would really like to take the opportunity to congratulate Carolyn for receiving the Woman of the Year Award for 2019 in the Asian chapter of Women in IT. So please join me in congratulating her. Absolute pleasure, Carolyn. Uh, next, we have Gaurav Modi, MD for Southeast Asia, Hong Kong and Taiwan for Capgemini. Gaurav is no stranger in this region, and he's got his unique entrepreneurial skills that uh, he brings to Capgemini. He's worked there for nine years, and Capgemini, as you know, is one of the fastest growing consulting firms in this region. Welcome, Gaurav. Uh, and then we have SG Innovate's own, Suchitra Narayan, uh, who I'm sure many of you out here know. Uh, Suchitra brings her expertise as a long-time tech uh, industry analyst to help the vibrant startup ecosystem here in Singapore. And on a very personal note, I've had the pleasure of being a colleague and having learned a lot from her technology insights over the years. And finally, let's welcome ecosystem principal advisor, Tim Sheedy, back on stage. We'll just you know, get you to work a little more while we have you here. So, all right. So to begin with, let's just um, you know, finish off some of the conversations around cybersecurity and AI. And uh, um, before we go on to talking more about transformation, because it would be a shame not to talk about digital transformation given uh, the expertise of especially two of our, uh, our panelists here. And then we'll also talk about the implications for the startup and the innovator community later on. Um, I'll start with you, Carolyn, uh, just because you're sitting right next to me. Uh, one of the hats that you wear is uh, being the vice chair for Rosscham's Digital and Cyber Committee. So, um, and we've heard Alex's presentation, and Alex has been talking about you know, the technologies that are there. We've been talking about the managed security service providers that are there in the market. So it's not that the technology is not there. So why is it that organizations you know, keep facing this, you know, this challenge in implementing you know, uh, consistent cybersecurity measures? I think in my opinion, uh, what I have observed is there's lots of technological uh, solutions out there in the security space, but what's really challenging is actually the human factor. In reality, even if you have unlimited budget, which is unusual and never really happens around security, um, in reality, it's the everyday person in the workforce that can actually really open up the highest amount of risk um, in that space. So I think being able to train people up on being cyber savvy is something that's really important. I think organizations try their best to do it. However, it doesn't always really stick. And I guess all you really need is someone to be really callous um, for something to really open up in a very, um, I guess, uh, risky way. Okay, so it's uh, interesting that you should say so. We, you know, given that this is a, most of you are involved in deep tech, so it's not always about the technology. Sometimes it can very well be about people. Uh, so, Tim, um, thank you for sharing your predictions for AI earlier. And one of the areas that we have not discussed today, especially because Randeep, our Cities of the Future expert, is not here, is uh, the growing role of AI in smart city initiatives. You know, and like, you know, we have intelligent infrastructure, we have smart energy, we have smart mobility, public safety especially. So just going back to the people context that Carolyn provided, um, do you think that ethical factors and the people and you know, our issues around people would actually be a hindrance to large-scale AI adoption in like governments? Yeah, um, the, the smart city space is an interesting one, and, and smart economies like here in Singapore. Um, th there's often a lot more talk and promise than than is actually delivered. Um, often there are some significant budgeting challenges. Um, of you know, working across agencies, across um, levels of government, etc., which actually mean that um, you know the, the best intentions never happen. Actually, a, a good example of this is in um, in Queensland. The Queensland motorway worked out that if they spent a couple of hundred million, they could make their motorway smart and increase the capacity by 40%. Mm -hmm. um, instead, they uh, worked out that the government could get more votes by spending three billion and in putting a new lane on each way um, and in increasing the capacity by 30%. So, you know, winning votes is, is important, but 
But, but what's stopping the AI initiatives in, in my experience so far is th this question of data security. So I guess bringing, I guess, the two themes of today together around AI and security is that um, there is a general lack of trust in our government's ability to secure our data, right? And that's ultimately what our concern is. That, you know, um, Alex talked a lot about data privacy, right? And look, and I know Singapore's a little different. I, I know Singapore, you, you have a good government, perhaps. Is a, a, but, well, <laughs> but you, you run like a proper business, right? Whereas in Australia, and in nearly every other economy, the security person in that department was hired at the lowest possible cost, right? And we're relying on them to secure our data. <laughs> so there's this question of, you know, do we actually have the policies, the capabilities, the technologies, the procedures, the people in place to be able to secure the data that makes our systems intelligent? And I think, well, we know that a lot of the time the answer to that is no. Governments are getting you know, hacked as, as often, if not more often, than private sector organisations. And so, therefore, you know, it's these governments that are collecting data, trying to do intelligent things with it, that aren't securing that data very well. Again, I, I had a personal experience with the Australian Tax Office um, when I was, a couple of years ago, I, I, you know, I was speaking, I, I rang them and they automatically did a, do you want to register your voice? So your voice is your passport, basically your voice is your ID. And I went, oh yeah, that makes it easy. And I went through this process, took a few minutes, and then afterwards I went, oh my God, I've just given my voice ID to an organisation I know is highly insecure, <laughs> right? And, and like, you know, if, if your password fails, you can, you know, gets hacked, you can change your password. I can't change my voice. <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the things that's, that's stopping, like, so what, government's having great ideas and then they go into committees and they go into working groups. And these are the discussions that stop these great AI initiatives from happening in, in cities. I know, look, you know, if you're in China, it just happens and, you know, you don't have anyone saying no to the things because a single um, body makes the decisions. But in democracies, we are seeing that smart government and smart cities are happening much slower yeah. because of the um, concerns of citizens. Like San Francisco, you know, banning the use of facial recognition for exactly, police work. Exactly, right. Yeah, yeah. And New York following suit, right? So things like that would happen as well. Okay, so now let's shift the focus a little bit and talk a little more holistically about digital transformation. And we have, of course, two experts here. Gaurav, I will come to you, but I have one question for Carolyn before I go on. So again, the way I asked you about the challenges for cybersecurity, um, in your experience in implementing digital transformation, uh, you know, uh, like organizations that implement digital transformation uh, programs and on their journeys, what challenges do they mostly face? Actually, quite a few challenges, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, the first, I think, is really very much on people actually thinking that digital transformation is about technology when it really isn't. Um, digital transformation is actually about people and how you can actually make work um, faster, better, cheaper. You know, and on top of that, uh, one of the main challenges I see is actually around change management, whereby we spend so much time and money focusing on technology, but in reality, the true challenge about uh, digital transformation is actually about the mindset, the user adoption, people wanting to use technology um, and learn new skills. And I think it's that human factor that makes it very challenging. So while people might think about digital transformation surrounding new technologies, which is true, um, in reality, why it usually fails is actually usually the human factor side of it, whereby organizations are finding it really hard to get people to change the way they do, do work, um, to be able to get them into training sessions to learn things differently and to make that um, really stick in the long term. So the user embedment is really very challenging. Right, so when we were having a conversation backstage, you said something about you know um, executive management buy-in, senior management buy-in, and what it essentially means is for many organizations is just getting the budget. But you said that it's way more than just the budget. The senior management should actually believe that the transformation journey uh, 
will help the organization and, and help create the roadmap, right? Yes, absolutely. Because in reality, there's no point in the generals telling the team what to do if they themselves don't believe in it and practice it. And, you know, in reality, most people are quite savvy as to what the senior managers or CEOs are like. And I think one of the success stories is actually, uh, as you all know, you know, DBS, whereby the CEO is the one leading the charge, mm -hmm. setting the scene, um, putting a lot of time and money, not just in technology, but also in change management, making sure they have the right agile coaches to the point that he wanted the whole organization to be agile and he himself actually brought the agile mindset into the ex-co meetings which is very unusual but it just shows the level of dedication that they're prepared to do to change the top levels as well as every other level below there and what i try to find uh, when when you look at digital transformation going wrong is you see a distinct um i guess uh gap between what happens at the top versus what happens in the middle and lower la layers. Um, sometimes the top will say, yes, we really want to do digital transformation and here's the budget, go away and do it. But they don't practice it, they don't believe in it. it, they think it's everyone else's problem to go and fix it and to execute it. And what you then see is everybody else, all the employees being very disenchanted because all of a sudden they are working really long hours. And I think one of the issues with digital transformation is that the budgets are usually so tight that people will have to do their normal BAU roles and over on top of that, then work on transformation projects. So your team already starts getting very burnt out and they would actually dislike the transformation project before they even started because they're not seeing their families for dinner anymore. That's not a good way to start, is it? Um, Gaurav, I promised I'll come to you soon. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question, but with a twist. Uh, so. Many organizations have failed in their digital transformation journeys, and that's a fact, right? And you are one of those organizations who's helping these people succeed. So as a tech vendor, what are your major challenges, you know, when implementing digital transformation for your clients? Right. So actually, I, I, I kind of echo, you know, your thoughts, Caroline. I'll, I'll just probably take it a step up. So typically, when we engage with organizations, let's look at two facets in terms of capability. One is the tech capability, and second is the leadership capability. You know, we we did uh, a survey with uh, 1,000 plus organizations in 2012, and we repeated it uh, late last year. Uh, and uh, let's look at the tech capability and split into two parts. You know, which is experimentation on technology and kind of you know, using the technology for business benefits. Split into two parts, front end of the business, what you can refer to as customer experience, and back end of the business, which is, say, operations in a way. In the six years, the amount of money which has been spent and the benefits which customers have been able to get in customer experience largely remain the same. In operations, it has gone down because customers find it increasingly painful to do back end transformation. Now think about customer experience. You cannot have a seamless customer experience till the time your back end is sorted, right? And the CEOs are worried because every CEO knows that you know the moment they decide to go with a $150 million program to change their back end, there is a high probability that they're going to lose their jobs, right? So there is, a, there is an element of transformation which is missing uh, on the tech capability part. Comparing the survey, uh, the, the confidence of organizations in terms of tech leadership having the skill sets across both customer experience and operations has largely remained the same. I come to the second part, which is, uh, which is the leadership capability. In six years, the leadership capability has gone down from almost 43% to 33%, which means people are far less confident that they have the ability, they have the people, they have the operating model, they have a shared vision, they have the relationships between business and technology, to be able to successfully deliver a transformation program. That's where the big challenge comes, and you know, which is what Caroline said. It's about people. You know, somebody sets up a vision, people are not, even the leadership teams are not able to take the whole organizations together on a journey. You know, you cannot do digital by giving the budget to 50 people, hiring a technology vendor who's gonna bring additional 100 people and say, all right, I'm going to change uh, or I'm going to digitally transform. So there is an absolute lack of clarity there or a true intent from the leadership teams to do it. I think third part, and I think which, you know, uh, which, uh, which we kind of heard this morning uh, at President Obama's speech as well. You know, for you to be able to change, you need to change at the top. How many boards within Asia Pac have been able to bring in the change? The average age of boards in Asia Pac 
still is 60 plus, and you're talking about dealing with the millennials. You know, you cannot understand their mindset. How many have been able to change in terms of the diversity of leadership, the diversity of thought in their boards? So till the time all those things happen, transformation is going to be a painful exercise, uh, you know, which customers would have to go through. And the organizations which have been able to push through, you know, you gave the example of DBS, wonderful, wonderful case. It has been driven from the top. You know, we work with organizations like Daimler. You know, even somebody who is an accounts payable employee, he is going through agile training. That's the level of intensity you need to push in terms of an organization's ability to successfully transform. So the challenges are large, not so much on technology. Uh, you know, skill sets are scarce, but still can be trained, uplifted. Uh, challenges more in terms of people, leadership, culture, ability to get your team together. Right. And in the end, I suppose systems integrators and consulting firms will do really well in you know, bringing it we all try. together. Yeah. yeah, good for your business, yeah. Anyway, so um, um, one last question to you, Carolyn, and before I move on to Suchitra. Um, so uh, let's talk about innovation for a bit. You know, so every corporate worth its salt today, they have an innovation center, right? Many of those organizations actually have organization-wide uh, innovation KPIs. So why is it that they still need to engage with the startup and innovator community? Why is it that you know, many of these innovation centers do not really succeed? So what is it that the startup community, the, inno the individual innovators, what, is it, what value do they bring to the ecosystem? With startups, I would say that the ones that tend to do well and are successful, they have already identified niches in the market that the traditional players are not playing in. Uh, we have seen that with the insurance, such as Ping An. We've seen it with, say, my bank from um, Jack Ma as well, whereby he was able to then um, expand on this online bank, which has really taken over China because he's noticed that all the traditional banking players were not able to lend money to the everyday person who wants to set up a small business. And he does that through technology by looking at 5,000 data points um, to then ascertain the risk profile of that particular organization or person. None of the banks were doing that, and now he's making so much money from it. And what I'm trying to say here is use that example whereby a lot of traditional players are used to doing things their own selves. And because they're so used to business as usual or doing incremental steps with their transformation, they can't always see um, life outside of where they live. And hence, it does take people who are fairly astute, who may be familiar with the industry, to be able to then go, OK, this is an area that they're not doing well in or not doing at all. And this is how we think we can take over it. Um, and you know, answering the earlier question around innovation and why some innovation labs don't work, I think we've seen many um, organizations, especially um, the, fin the, the financial services such as uh, insurance and banking, about five to seven years ago, um, set up innovation labs. And they were terribly arrogant towards uh, consulting firms and other vendors because they thought they could do everything themselves. And in the end, after two years, a lot of them shut down because there's no return on investment. And the reason why there's no ROI, I mean, there's a few reasons. One of it is because the innovation labs are set up as a silo. Now, why would you set up something as a silo when you want to integrate that innovation into all parts of the business, right? Secondly, uh, it depends on the type of people that we hire into the innovation labs. Um, a lot of times, they are very highly skilled, so there's nothing wrong there. However, they may not understand the culture of the organization or the true challenges on the business as usual part to be able to integrate the true innovation into the true pain points in those organizations. So I'd say that it's actually quite a few factors around it. And I think this is where the startups can actually really thrive. And also, I think also um, startups don't actually have the same rigor and bureaucratic nature as the larger players. Yeah. You know, all they really need is one or two really good backers financially for them to do what they need to do. And they don't have to jump over hoops, lots of gateways. They don't have to write business cases and go through all those kind of um, bureaucratic, I guess, uh, expected uh, uh, behaviors required. In the larger organizations, so they can actually move a lot faster and cheaper and better. Right. Yeah. So the agility, um, and I. So now that we know, you know, we've heard from Carolyn about the relevance of the startup ecosystem. Um, so Chitra, Singapore has emerged quite the hub for innovation, and especially in deep tech and organizations like SG Innovate has got a huge role to play in incubating it. So in your experience in helping them, uh, which are the technology and the industry areas that you're seeing a lot of innovation happening? And where do you think the innovation will happen in the next year or so? So one uh, caveat before I answer the question is we are 
looking at it from a venture capital standpoint. I think we've represented okay. the corporate standpoint sure. here and an analyst standpoint. So the venture capital is a little bit different because we are looking at futuristic disruptive yeah. technologies. So that's the caveat. Um, given that, we, I think we're looking very much at solving for global issues and concerns that everybody should be aware of, clean tech, uh, food tech, agri-tech, energy. Um, these are things that we're always looking to see new and disruptive ideas in. Um, quantum, that's another space that we've made uh, quite a few recent investments in. I think both from the perspective of um, security in the future, as well as obviously um, higher processing capability and supercomputing. Um, another one is um, autonomous everything. I say autonomous everything because sort of autonomous vehicles, they fit into a broader robotics spectrum, uh, so to speak. And automation has been around for a very long time from the robotics uh, standpoint. But if you look at even robotics, they just use vision right now, but getting human senses is something that we will start to see moving forward, but autonomous vehicles would be augmented with that as well. Um, and finally, uh, healthcare and med tech, you know, bringing, bringing solutions that use AI, uh, ML into day-to-day -day life or predictive. Uh, we've got companies in our portfolio that um, are used to predict cancer markers for predicting strokes. Um, there's one that actually can um, predict the occurrence of a cardiac um, instance about a couple of weeks before it happens. So things that would help with the global aging population. I mean, globally we are aging, and we need to figure out solutions for predictive maintenance of humans. Yeah. I, I always get very enthused when healthcare is mentioned, and uh, because um, I wrote the health tech um, um, report as well, the predicts report, I'll take the opportunity, you know, just talk a little bit about health tech and stop being a moderator for a bit. So uh, in the healthcare space, you know, I see innovation in three different buckets, you know. There is the scientific-based innovations around geno genomics and, you know, all of that that Suchitra was saying. But then there is also the, you know, the emerging technology adoption like AI, machine learning within the organizations, within healthcare provider organizations, hospitals, that actually help with the, you know, the care outcome. And then I also see innovation in business models. You know, there are different healthcare organizations. For example, a few years back in Australia, uh, public hospitals started private wings to you know, increase um, their um, capability of providing care. So there's a constant change for that. But the biggest trend that I will see, that I expect to see in 2020 for healthcare, is that the healthcare industry will finally start learning from other industries. They will no longer go for the CIO and the CTO who's got 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry. They will look for the CIO and the CTO who has got experience in retail industry or hospitality or the financial services industry. And I do think that healthcare has got a lot to learn from fintech, you know, when it comes to inclusion and as well as how they um, kind of helped uh, the banking industry uh, improve their customer outcomes. So just that little bit of, you know, um, aside on healthcare, and I go back to being a moderator now. And back to you, Suchi, again, for your next question. I just mentioned uh, FinTech, and um, we've seen several of the early FinTech organizations, they failed, right? They did make an impact, they did disrupt the industry, but they failed. And I personally think that they failed because many of them uh, pursued something like innovation for you know, innovation's sake. They just innovated. They didn't really address a real problem statement. They didn't really, you know, uh, have true understanding of the financial services industry. They knew the technology. So um, at SG Innovate, or, you know, in your experience, how do you help um, startups actually, you know, kind of um, not avoid this pitfall? So, um there's, there's two parts to that question, right? Um, we she invest speaks like a true analyst. There's only <laughs> two parts. There's, there's two parts. Um, one is that we invest in very, very early stage startups. So we are banking on disruptive technologies. And to, to give the analogy, you know, Ford um, made the statement, if you actually go back to your customers and always ask the customers what do they want, in the early, late 1800s, they would have said, I want a faster horse. But he built the motor car, right? So sometimes 
product can lead market. I don't necessarily believe that it always has to be market-led. Yeah. Now, market-led is much easier in a B2C context. Um, so obviously, I can go from one user today to a million users tomorrow. But from a B2B context, that's, it's much harder to be product-led. It's much easier to be market-led. But I would say that if you're market-led, it's unlikely that you're truly disruptive and that you're doing something different. Mm -hmm. So we do place our bets on founders, very early stage technologies that are at the cutting edge of technology. They're taking risks, they're moonshots. Not all of them, but some of them certainly are moonshots. But they're working for the greater global good. Um, and how do we help them? Um, I suppose we, we do um, venture building. So we build out ventures from grounds up. If we think something is a good idea, and the founders have a solid technology background, we will support them in building out their business cases and connecting them to, to advisors, to mentors, not just in Singapore, but globally, um, as well as, of course, I mean, we want to take equity stake and help them with their fundraise as well. Um, so many, many ways that we would support them. But yeah, there are two parts to it. One is product-led innovation, and the other is market-led innovation. Yeah. Right. Um, um, so. I would say the startups and the innovator, you know, the t entire ecosystem out there, they would do well to align themselves to a larger ecosystem. You know, something like SG Innovate also gives them that opportunity, but also large corporates as well, right? And many of them have succeeded because of their affiliations to larger corporates as well. So, uh, Gaurav, this one's for you. Um, how do you see these large corporates engaging with the startup and the innovator community? How do you see them doing it now? And how do you think it's going to change in the future, in the near future, maybe? Sure. So again, I think there are two parts to it. <laughs> uh, we're all analysts, I guess. So I think the first part is that there is a difference in being an investor and an operator. The mindset is very different. Uh, so Capgemini, you know, we play on both sides. We have Capgemini Ventures, which essentially focuses on early stage startups in which Capgemini would put in money. Uh, but I think we've learned that putting money and managing it as an investor is not exactly the same as uh, you know, using them as an operator. Uh, so as an operator, what we do is that Capgemini established uh, what we term as uh, applied innovation exchanges. We have around 11 across the globe in different parts, in San Francisco, in uh, Paris, in Mumbai, in Singapore. Uh, in Melbourne uh, and a few other places. The job of these applied innovation exchanges is to deeply embed ourselves into the local ecosystem. And in each market or in each area we have this ecosystem, we've typically seen that, like the ones in Germany, there is a lot of innovative stuff happening around auto sector. Uh, the one in, uh, uh, in France we have in Lille is a lot of innovation happening around the retail sector. Uh, we have one which is a flagship in San Francisco. It's kind of you know across and AI and security and many other areas. So as an operator, what we do is that our job is to stay embedded, first of all, in that ecosystem and make sure we bring that ecosystem to our large customers. When we bring them to large customers, the first part is that we are exposing them to the customers and customers getting kind of you know exposed to them to see these are the possibilities. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily play our part to say that you know we have to be a party uh, to the transactions. These part these transactions could be directly between the startup and between the kind of end customer. In some cases, you know, after the initial prototypes are successful or the customer is okay, uh, these you have to industrialize that thing at a large scale with the customer, which requires substantial amount of integrations, which requires substantial amount of operating model change or cultural change, which, uh, which kind of you know, needs to be brought up at the customer place. That's the part which we play uh, to kind of you know, make sure that we are able to educate the startup in terms of how it is going to get industrialized at a scale with the customer. What are the capabilities you need to build up? How we can help you support it? That's one part. We have also seen that although customers could be happy with the initial 
prototypes which they do with these startups. Sometimes there is a nervousness because in these startups are sometimes 10 people, 15 people organizations. There is a there is a nervousness about what happens if these guys don't exist. You know what happens to the IP, you know which I'm going to put into my core systems. So Capgemini plays a part in terms of being an orchestrator to mitigate the risk on both sides. Sometimes we do that by becoming an investor, or sometimes we kind of manage that by becoming uh, more of a risk manager for the customer by putting appropriate clauses which benefit both sides uh, to manage that process. Uh, so we are doing it quite, uh, quite, uh, I think, uh, 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 strongly in terms of getting into that embedded part. And I think just to the last point, uh, uh, the, the, the KPIs of our applied innovation exchange, we are not measuring it in terms of how much revenue or profitability they are generating. We are actually measuring, you know, what innovative solutions they have been able to bring up to the customers. What value has the customer been able to generate by leveraging those innovations? So it's not internally focused, it's completely externally focused. Uh, the people who had these AIs are measured on that dimension rather than internal dimension. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, we have a few questions according to Slido, but before we move to the Q&A section, um, Tim, um, I wanted to just uh, ask you one last question about um, your prediction, a little bit about your prediction, that is. You said that an automation would be like the shortcut to AI adoption in organization, shortcut for a want of better words. Uh, and I'm sure there are uh, several members in the audience out here, uh, both startups, innovators, SMEs, who are working on automation solutions. Um, in our ecosystem AI study, when we asked um, what kind of vendors do you engage with for your robotic process automation uh, solutions, we got a certain set of vendors. And then when we asked them what kind of uh, vendors do you associate with, what, uh, what do you engage with when you do smart process automation, right, in inbuilt uh, uh, machine learning, um, we got a different set of vendors. Uh, just like your comment on that, you know, like why this difference? And I think that it's an important lesson for the audience out here. There's a lesson right there. Like people do engage with two different set of um, you know, uh, vendors as their automation uh, solution becomes more complicated and complex. Yeah, so I, I think the, the simplest answer to this is what's happening in the market is that the, the and, and this is quite, quite a strange happening because AI is, uh, I know we're talking about security earlier, right? And they're talking about the consolidation of the market and it, you know, there's hundreds or thousands of vendors and then it consolidates down to 20 or 30 and then down to five or 10 over a 10, 15 year period. Um, here we are at the beginning of AI, and it's already come down to four vendors. It's Microsoft, Azure, AWS, Google, and IBM. Uh, the, the big cloud platforms are the big AI platforms today. Uh, most software firms are, are stopping, no longer building their own machine learning tools and capabilities. They are themselves leveraging the uh, particular capabilities in the cloud um, because they're just better and cheaper and faster and more reliable and you know, e easy to access. And I mentioned in the predictions that they're getting easier and easier to access uh, these capabilities. So, um, so, so yeah, but if you look at RPA and automation, it actually came from you know, the, the service providers themselves. A lot of the Indian service providers, the way they made money out of their contracts was by using automation tools that they wrote themselves. So they have a lot of their own tools. Um, you know, one of the fastest emerging automation tools at the moment is, is actually a tool that was developed by one of the large global SIs. Uh, you know, the, the RPA spaces come from this very fragmented, lots of different companies implementing a solution, you know, one that will scour a websites for prices for your competitors so you can always match their prices. Another tool that will, you know, help something in your call center happen faster, et cetera. Um, whereas, you know, and, and all those companies are talking about making their products smart and they're trying to add machine learning into them. But the reality is that their clients aren't hearing that message. Their clients are hearing, or their clients are thinking, if I want machine learning, I'm going to go to my core machine learning platform, which is AWS or IBM or or one of the key ones. A lot of that's because that's where their data sits. And AI is about data. It's about big data sets and doing lots of learning and constant learning. And you don't want to be constantly moving your data around to, to different applications to do learning. 
so your RPA tool and the IT team, you know, needs this data that you have to move across constantly, and then you have to move the data across to your call center RPA tool, etc. Um, you want all your data to remain in a single place and do the learning on it and develop your algorithms from there. So that's what sort of where we see it going. And as I said, it is surprising that the market has consolidated to these big four vendors so early with the penetration rate at 10%, 15%. Um, but uh, yeah. there it is. Okay. So thank you for that. Um, I'll move on to uh, some of the questions. Uh, I do have a couple more questions for the panelists. I'll leave that for the last. Um, let me see. Um, Suchitra. Uh, let me see. If, I mean, maybe you can address this. What do you think is the biggest opportunity for blockchain? And you know, what is like you know? How are you seeing the blockchain uh, space uh, develop in Singapore? Um, again, going back to I suppose when you look at uh, solving for bigger global issues, we have investments in uh, an organization that looks at ensuring that fundraise goes to the right refugees when we raise funds, right? Again, via enabled via blockchain. Another solution is in agri-tech where we are able to trace back um, exactly to which orchard a particular fruit came from. Now, imagine the instances of um, an outbreak of a bacteria or like we've had in Australia, the, the uh, needles and the strawberries or whatever else it might be, um, you're able to trace it back rather quickly and figure out what was the supply chain, what did it look like, and then identify where the problem points are. So certainly that is something that we have looked at and it's something that we've made investments in. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see very well without my glasses. Um, <laughs> with my glasses, sorry, yeah. Um, Carolyn, uh, I think this one's more, uh, best suited for you. How do we influence human behavior to be more data and cyber savvy? <laughs> I'm sorry. Very tricky question. Uh -huh. I think that there's general training that needs to be done. I think that also needs to be uh, Reminders. So, for example, in common areas such as your pantry or even your bathrooms, to have little stickers that remind you of different scenarios where, you know, there are cyber um, opportunities for breaches. Uh, may it be, you know, um, phishing or may it be ransomware and so on. But to actually just have something that's quite graphic um, that helps people to remember is useful. Um, but I think more importantly, to actually be able to influence people in terms of the culture. And when I say this, I mean uh, every employee should feel that they can uh, be able to contact IT in an efficient manner uh, whenever they think that there's something that doesn't look quite right or they feel like they need to double check something, such as an attachment, for example. And for that culture to be such a safe place that this can be done um, as frequently as needed, hopefully not all the time and every time, but a safe culture where people can feel that, oh, I'm not sure about this attachment or I'm not sure about this particular file, to be able to contact the right people to say, hey, can you just check this for me? And if it's just a false alert, so be it, let's not penalize this person. But to create that safe culture where there's a closer relationship between you know, the average employee versus people who are the experts in this area. And quite often, I think people are a little bit nervous to go, oh, I'm not really sure if I should pass this on to IT and so on, I'll just open it anyway. And I think that's where the issue sits, where, which is that slight fear of being, um, you know, negatively thought of when you do that. So I think it's both ways. One is, um, you know, the, 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 at the top where you try to educate people, and I think it's also at the bottom layer, at the operational side. Yeah. Um, I'll um, give this one to you, Gaurav. Uh, I, there seems to be quite a few data scientists in the audience because there seems to be very concerned questions from the data scientists out there. So it says that you know um, companies like Microsoft and sorry that's not the one. Okay, you said uh, hang on a second. Yeah. So basically, um, uh, Tim said something in his uh, presentation which says that data scientists uh, their roles may not be the way um, you know it is envisioned today. So uh, quite a few SOS kind of questions saying that where would the data scientists go? How is their role going to change? Um, where do you see that, you know, especially, you know, in an organization like yours? Yeah. <coughs> see, uh, see, I have a 
slightly different view on the AI side. I think one of the biggest obstacles to customers moving on, large customers moving on to the AI side is data. They don't have the right data in place yet. You know, t take a few examples. Take the case of a telecom company. You know, you know where are the every telco company wants to come out with billing plans which are as personalized to each individual as they can be and generated on the fly. You know, if you look through the systems in their existing billing systems, you know where where do their uh, billing plans reside. They are in old XML files or maybe in Excel files in their legacy billing systems and they haven't changed their billing plans for the last 10 years or they've just kept on adding. So there are maybe 2,000 to 3,000 plus billing plans which are residing there. You know, and a million consumers in all those different billing plans. Now you tell them that I want to come out with an AI engine which is going to address a specific need for a segment, forget about each customer, a segment of customers. They need to understand their billing plans first, they need to rationalize their billing plans first, they need to figure out the data flow of how uh, you know, I need to get an outcome of giving you a specific billing plan. And that takes time, that takes effort, and that cuts across the enterprise. So. He, 70 to 80 percent of the effort initially for an AI program has to go in into understanding data. So with us, the challenge is that customers come to us and say, you know, I'm thinking of initiating an AI program. I want to automate and kind of you know, have the bots and intelligence in my front-ending customer systems. This is okay. Let's start talking about it. You, you know your data? Mm, I think I do. I have the technology systems in place. I have an SAP running, a, you know, Oracle running. Since these are systems, I think I have the data. No, you don't have the data. You're going to take a year to first understand the data, and then you start to build algorithms on top of it. I think that's probably the first part of it. Data scientists come after that, right? So is there an opportunity, or is there a big demand for data scientists? The answer is yes, of course, yes. But right now, the, those data scientists also are spending a fair bit of time understanding data so that when you start to build the algorithms, it's easier for you to put a context to which data you are using for what kind of an algorithm. I think that's probably, I think, uh, uh, one part. Yeah. Can I, uh, I just wanted to add to that. Even with our startups, when we introduce them to corporates, I think that is a big stumbling block because the corporates come back and say, we've got a ton of data. Actually, you don't have data. You've just got information. And there's a big difference between having data and having information. And I think those two terms are you know, misused quite a lot, which results in stepping back and saying, OK, how do I translate this information to convert into data, which makes sense? And then you can deploy right. AI systems or whatever. Yeah. So some of, maybe just last point on that. It's an interesting topic. Some of the, some of the best customers you may look at, the ones we use in our day-to-day -day lives, you may call them absolutely at the top end of the digital chain or digital maturity chain, uh, they don't know who their customers are. You know, I've been in Singapore for 11 years now. Uh, my mortgage is with somebody, my salary account is with somebody else, you know, my car loan is with somebody else, and uh, uh, no, they don't uh, understand, uh, you know, where uh, kind of, you know, uh, the actual customer is. Yeah. And we are talking about people who have tons of money to spend. You know, people have a huge reputation to attract and train a lot of people, but they haven't been able to use it. Right. Um, so uh, I, I agree with you. Um, and uh, I think one of the exciting opportunities for data scientists um, is to actually get away from that humdrum stuff. Like this, the idea of applications becoming smarter at the moment. We're using our data scientists to work on processes in the financial system to make it three clicks instead of ten clicks to make that invoice, you know, or automated. Like, that, that, that's not stuff that differentiates our business, right? It saves us some money, yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't differentiate us. And I think this is where, like, even using that billing system example, now, now our billing systems today are dumb and they're not, you know, they, they don't automate much. Um, but I believe the, the next generations will become smart and they'll tell us what the new bill, you know, the, how we should bill uh, more effectively and that customer, you know, should go on this um, billing, you know, style instead of that one, right? 
Um, and, and that again, but, but that's, when everyone's doing that, that's no longer a competitive advantage. That again frees up the data scientists to work on really the moonshots, the, the, the big things that, that are really differentiate our businesses or your clients' businesses. That's where I see the, the huge opportunity going forward. And that's where the high value is. And that's, I, you know, I hear a lot of companies complain about the cost of data scientists. Um, I, I'm not sure how much, what the average data science sal salary is here, but there's a growing expectation that a data scientist doesn't just have a degree, but they have 10 or 15 years business experience too, right? And so that makes that person pretty, you know, pretty senior, pretty expensive, right? So you want them working on really good things, not making it easier to invoice a customer to, to save a few steps in the process, which is where we're sort of wasting a lot of their time today. So I'll take one for the team. Uh, there's one uh, which uh, uh, says, um, uh, what do you think about remote patient monitoring? Is it going to be a big hit soon? Uh, remote patient monitoring is happening in a big way. In the hospitals when you know the clinician is not there, the clinician is having dinner at home, they can access. It's happening in hospitals across the world. It's happening in health systems across the world. Uh, the question, I think, is more about when uh, home-based care would take over, when you'd actually be able to provide health care for patients who are away from the hospital. From the technology standpoint, there is no issues with that whatsoever. The technology to provide remote health care within the hospital and the technology to provide uh, remote health care outside the walls of the hospital is exactly the same. No difference there. Of course, uh, there is a little more reliance on network. There's a little more reliance on your you know, security and how you are going to be uh, able to secure your own apps. But the, pol the problem is essentially a policy problem. In uh, m many, many countries, they have problems with actually uh, who is going to monetize it, who, the, what are the regulatory, what are the compliance issues. Suppose you are providing remote health care, suppose the patient dies, who is liable for it? Will the insurance cover it? So as far as I'm concerned, remote health care is very much happening there. It's, it's, it's been happening for the last four, five years. But the policies around it have not changed largely, especially in emerging economies. Um, and can I add to that, um, you're, you're absolutely right that the question of funding is a big one. I've seen it take off, remote monitoring is taking off in countries where there's a single health system yes. where it's provided, where there are multiple, where there's public and private. Um, you know, my private insurer would probably rather I die of a heart attack and have no costs, right, or, or me going to the public system, right, I have a heart attack, I go into the public system and they don't have any cost at all. Right, so they could be monitoring going, oh God, this guy's gonna have a heart attack. Let's not yeah. tell anyone. <laughs> and, and that's, they're financially incented to do that, right? And that's, and so that's like a Australia. big problem in many economies in the US, the UK, et cetera, so that's what I'm saying, it's, it's there in a country like Australia with, with the nationalized healthcare system. And there are many that don't have that, so it's obviously much tougher. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your questions and I apologize if I couldn't address all of them. We are kind of running out of time. But I thought that it would be an absolute shame to have three experts here. Tim already got his say with his predictions. We have three experts from the industry here. It would be an absolute shame not to get their predictions for 2020 um, while we have them here. So I'll start with you, Carolyn. Um, what do you predict for the tech um, technology space in 2020? Top three. Uh, Asia being the battleground for digital banking. Okay. Um, China leading the way in AI and crypto. Okay. And uh, much deeper collaboration between HR and tech teams. The reason being that we really need to think about what human augmentation in the workplace looks like and what the future of work looks like. And the future of work isn't about the future, it's actually about right now. Right. Actually, Tim has written our predicts document for 2020 on workplace of the future, and he does cover that as well. So, yeah, good. It completely sinks. Gaurav, your tech predictions for 2020? Uh, investments in customer experience would continue to go up. Uh, massive, I think. Uh, hyper automation would lead to specific segments around AI. And AI is where uh, the back office transformation would happen because customers are worried about spending too much money on that. Right. So hyper automation in the back end, leveraging AI and hence yeah. moving towards uh, kind of a seamless customer experience. And uh, 
multi-cloud, which is already happening, I would say that uh, it would uh, pick up even more pace uh, with customers kind of, you know, uh, having the platforms to move their workloads across multiple clouds. Right, okay. And Suchi, I'll kind of uh, twist it around a little bit for you. Uh, your top uh, predictions for 2020 for the SME startup space, not necessarily from the tech domain. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it um, sort of as the investment areas yep. that we, we sure. look at and that we see coming up for 2020. Um, what we do see is um, everything from a perspective of citizen, but as well as infrastructure, digital security. I think uh, we have IoT uh, sensors with cyber security. I think that's definitely one area we'll be looking at. Um, another is from a healthcare and med tech standpoint. One is any solution that uses AI ML to help democratize and bring um, healthcare to the hands of mass citizens, mm -hmm. not just the elite. Um, so lower cost in an ideal, uh, ideal uh, manner. Um, and the second one as well is uh, chronic disease management. Bringing in chronic diseases, we are an aging population globally. So to take it away from the hospitals and bring that back into your homes and home care management with deep tech solutions, uh, that's something that I think would be really interesting for 2020. Um, as well as um, automation, I think automation as we know it, uh, from a perspective of physical robots. You know, every time we talk about robots, people have these two, two images that pop yeah. up in your mind. One is the cute little robots, like uh, the peppers Wally. of the world that walk around and bring yeah. you your towels in a Japanese hotel, or they have the transformer version, which is out there killing everybody and destroying the world, right? Uh, but but I, I think it's, it's something much more practical. It's going to be something that augments humans, and almost to your point of data scientists, frees up the human mind to do more creative, to do uh, higher level thinking jobs while you start to automate the lower end of jobs, whether it's through, right now there's vision, but imagine robots with a sense of touch, with a sense of taste, with a sense of you know, hearing that react rather quickly uh, that can prepare your food for you in an old age home or whatever else, or a brain computer interface which helps people with prosthetics to feel. I think that's something uh, we are certainly interested to look it's at. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful way to no, we end with, on a note of hope, actually, almost. Uh, with that, um, I end this panel, um, and you're free. To